And as we just sang on this Reformation Day, we are, this is our Reformation Celebration Sunday as it is the one that is closest to October 31st. I know that worldwide, when most people think of October 31st, it reminds them of that great Reformation Day (laughs) where God was pleased to begin the work through a man uh, to return to the scripture in a rich recovery of the gospel of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. And also then to begin to remind us that the design of all things is to the glory of God alone. Now we have been going through Romans chapter 15. I'm gonna ask you to stand with me once again as I read the beginning section of Romans 15 and then we will launch into a consideration of the richness of God's glory today. So listen as I read Romans chapter 15 beginning in verse one down through verse seven. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good and to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together with one voice the, that we may that together with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7. Therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, as we uh, see this great emphasis, even in these few verses that we've read, Lord, that we would live, that our relationships and our interaction, our worship and our fellowship would be done in such a way that you would receive glory and that you would be glorified. We pray, O God, that as we just do our best to consider something of this great truth in this time, that you would enlarge our hearts, that you would give us understanding, that by your spirit, through your word, you would grant us a glimpse of your glory that would lay us low in humility and exalt you in your excellence. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. And so we see together that those last two verses there, uh, or last few verses in chapter 15, verse six of Romans says that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is our hope and that is our desire and I think the more we rightly understand the scripture, God's people will come together with one heart, one mind, one judgment and one voice. All glory to God and God alone that it won't be divided between him and anyone else. Him and the preacher, him and the teacher, him and the organization, him and the building. No, glory will be absolutely to him alone. Now we call this Reformation Sunday and the reason why is because it is somewhat rooted in history and it's just simple consideration as we begin to unpack some things today. As you may well know on Wednesday, October 31st, in the year 1517, Martin Luther put the 95 Theses on the door of Wittenberg Castle. Now, without overplaying that, that was a common thing to indicate what would be the subject of preaching, teaching, and or discussion on the coming week. But what was so unique about this is he had begun in the contemplation of the scripture. And at this point, I must say, only begun to compare what the church was teaching and preaching to what the scriptures were saying. And it began to raise a number of doubts, concerns, and questions in his mind. 
The most essential ones weren't even raised in the 95 Theses, if you've ever read them. It was just a striking thing that he began to ask simple questions. For example, under the deceived belief of the popery in that age, their thought was this, the Pope could remit or forgive sins. And there are a multitude of people in their imagination who are in this in-between place of purgatory because they died and yet had some yet unconfessed sin, so they had to go to this temporary holding to pay the rest of the penalty. And if you want, your mama who's suffering there, you can buy an indulgence, pay some money, and then your mother would be released from purgatory by the authority of the Pope remitting her remaining sins and she would then enter into the presence of God. Don't you want to buy this so that your lovely mother doesn't continue to suffer? This was the idea so that we can raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica and he began to ask in there, if the Pope has the power to remit sin, then why does he not do so out of love? Why is he waiting upon money? Just began to process. He hadn't even yet figured out the Bible does not teach purgatory. It is appointed for man once to die and after that the judgment. That is it. There is no temporary in-between holding place where the saints still have to pay the penalty of sin. Actually to declare so is to deny the glory of Christ in the fullness of his sin-bearing work on the cross, which we will not do. But on that day, what had happened is he began to make questions that sort of indicated the be-all, end-all of truth is not the practice and tradition of the church. The be-all, end-all of truth is not the declarations and opinion of popes and councils. Began to recognize what the scriptures say is what we lay hold of and what we believe and what we teach. And so that began that, that thrust, which we oft call the first pillar of the Reformation, sola scriptura, scripture alone. And we would go further and say, tota scriptura. Scripture alone and all the scripture says needs to be contemplated. It is the word of God through which the Lord Jesus Christ exercises his dominion and authority and leadership in the context of the church. And so uh, the rest of that, in, in the beginning recognition of sola scriptura, they begin to evaluate the issues of Well, how is one saved? What must he do? What sort of works? What sort of penance? What sort of pilgrimages? And he began to realize through the study of Scripture, there is no human work of penance and payment. There is no pilgrimage that will get benefit, but that salvation, as taught by the Scripture, is by grace alone. It is the unmerited favor of God that he has bestowed. And he has done this by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There is no other salvation. Your faith is not in your deeds and your doing. Your faith is not in a man's uh, words or pronouncements. Your faith is wholly rooted in the person and work of Jesus Christ and the confidence of its finished fullness and nothing short of that and then begin to kind of take a bird's eye view on all of that and realize because what happens is all of these things are designed to the glory of God alone that's what we're going to really begin to consider today is that the scriptures sort of and clearly indicate that not only uh, the basics of, of history, but all that exists, exists to the glory of God alone. I began to mention it last week. For those who have been in certain circumstances, they have heard various creeds and confessions. And in one of the more famous ones, the Westminster Shorter Confession, it begins 
by saying, what is the chief end of man? And then it answers, a useful answer of sorts, by saying, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now, part of the challenge is, remember, creeds and confessions are written by men. They actually gave to the answer, what is the chief end of redeemed men? Because the chief end of redeemed man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The chief end of unredeemed men, there is not going to be any enjoyment. Right? There is nothing but eternal torment day and night forever and ever. So again, even when I see these dear men, what tends to happen is, why are you even starting with what is the chief end of man? Why don't you back up even further? What is the chief end of creation what is the chief end of everything and it is the glory of god because it's important we as we often emphasize there can be a tendency to be man-centered and it creeps in what about me what about me and more often it would be very healthy if we say what about christ what about god What would be pleasing in his sight? What would he have you do? What is the decision that would most honor him now? What about God? If we would ask that question of ourselves and to our kids more often, our processing of our decision making would be distinctly different. Now I'm gonna say a few things introductorily. You know, when I'm taking up this subject, there are a couple facts that I gotta lay out in the beginning. I am ill-equipped to communicate this with the full weight and glory that it deserves. Not only because of my limitations, but because of human limitations. We oft have words that are the best that our minds can construe, and God exceeds all of our comprehension. And so even when we begin to consider this, we're just going to see a glimpse of his glory through a glass dimly. But even that glimpse is in order glorious enough to lay us low and and get us a clearer idea of it. But further, we're told to ascribe to him glory. We're called to glorify God. And I just want to lay this out from the beginning. God in his essential glory, the glory that is in himself, nothing we do increases that glory. Nothing we do diminishes that glory. It is immeasurable, unknowable, and unchangeable and eternal. It is bound up in God himself and in the fullness of his beings and his attributes. Okay, and so you've got to understand that uh, we may glorify him more as an action, but that does not make him more glorious. And so sometimes, again, like when we read, ascribe to him the glory, do his name. Which, again, we've added the word do. It says the glory of his name. Where does that kind of leave us? Oh, wow. You know, just even as we launch in, There are a few words that are used in the Old and the New Testament to speak of the glory of God. And each of them even communicate an aspect of it just so that we can get a sense of it. In the Hebrew, you have the word kabot and the word halal. And in the New Testament, the word doxa most regularly. And a few other synonyms are used in there. Kabod carries the sense, uh, original sense of weightiness. So as weighty, as authoritative, as powerful as anything and anyone known to men, God's word holds more weight. God's person holds more power. And you know, the the way that I, I want us to remember this, 1 Corinthians 1541 says this, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from one another in their glory. 
And, and so we, we think of that which would be most glorious and you think of the sun on the brightest sunny day, unhindered, it's difficult to look directly at. And if you dare do, for any moment of time, and I recommend not to do so while driving, what happens when you then look away from that sun? It has so affected your vision, right? That it's almost as if because of that glory, everything else is somewhat washed out for a moment and that it, it somewhat comes back. Brothers and sisters, just a simple, subtle glimpse of the glory of God washes everything else out. These are all secondary glories. And there is a big difference between the brightness of the sun and the brightness of the moon. And that we can calculate and measure by means of lumens these days. But you know what we cannot do? Calculate the glory of God. You know, we can weigh most people and weigh most things and then calculate based on size but the weightiness the size the sclo- scope the glory the resplendence the beauty of god it's just absolutely beyond you know so uh, i remember when i uh, first went to seminary one of the things that was being told to us was this there's going to be a lot that happens here and in, the, in some of these classes, it's going to be like turning on a water fountain at full power, uh, I mean, a uh, 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 fire hydrant at full power, and then trying to take a drink. You know? You're only going to get a little bit of it, and the rest of it's going to pass you by. And that was the case. And, and you spend the rest of your life continuing to get a little more and a little more. I'm not going to ask you here to take a drink today. I would say just stand there in front of it and let it knock you down. (laughs) You know, once you're knocked down, let it continue to flow over you and just get a sense of, oh, what a great and glorious God we have. Incomprehensible. His weightiness, his praise, his worship, his beauty, his brightness, his resplendency, all of these things are are bound up in the concept to communicate the notion of glory to us. I want to take a few minutes to consider the psalm that we heard in the opening. So if you have your Bible, you can look with me in Psalm 96. We're going to go to a few places today. But in Psalm 96, some of the beautiful things that we see about this is the the people are called in this psalm There is a call to worship the glorious God. Listen to verses one to three. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Right, see, because God's glory fills all of his creation and is made manifest, all the earth is called to sing to his glory. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. And one of the things we're going to pick up is to rightly understand the glory of God, you've got to understand that salvation is all of God. To rightly, to rightly ascribe to God glory, you've got to understand that all that exists, all that you see and all that you experience has come into being by his own hands and work. As we move on to verse 3, it's, we see the call to witness to the world of God's glory. What does it say? Declare his glory among the nations. It should be that when we declare all the gods of men absolutely and utterly pale in comparison. And not just that they get the sense maybe this God is a little bit more powerful. Maybe this God is a little bit more able. But they understand, no, the difference is This is the true and living and powerful God and all the others are nothing. There is no other. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples because look at the comparison between the true glory of God and man's gods. Verse four and five. For God the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Again, I often read those things and think... 
I mean, we're gonna have meals together and people have brought desserts and someone will take a bite of something later and say, this is great. What's the recipe? And I'm oft astounded the best we can do is use a word that we use to describe desserts to also describe our God. You know, and I, and I get that, that. That's all we've got. But we understand that in all of these practical superlatives that we ascribe to things, they most superiorly and supremely speak of God beyond God our understanding it says great is the lord and greatly to be praised he is to be feared above all gods and you think okay because he's getting ready to say he's a little bit stronger a little bit weightier a little bit more influence no what does it say verse five for all of the gods of the peoples are worthless idols oh boy so you're saying He is of infinite worth, and they are worthless? Yes, you know. Uh, But the Lord made the heavens. Even goes on in verse 6 to to state it even further. Listen to what it says. Uh, Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Listen again in verse seven, the call to worship due to God's glory. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. So when there is a sense of his glory, What happens to men? They tremble. I mean, we are reminded, hopefully, where Isaiah is caught up in the vision in Isaiah 6 and catches a glimpse of the glory of God while around his throne the song is being sung, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is looking through dimly as smoke fills the throne room. So it is obscured so that he's not wiped out. And even in the obscured manifestation of God's glory, what is the response of Isaiah? Woe is me. I am undone. I am an unclean man of unclean lips. I'm an unclean people. It's just like, what am I doing here? I am finished. And of course, then a symbol of atonement was made that he might be enabled to stand there. But the reality was there was nothing that he would be able to do that would fit him to abide there. God himself would have to provide the atonement. God would ha- himself would have to provide the worthiness that access could be granted. And it's astounding when it says tremble before him. I think what kind of God is being preached? That the fear of God is lost among men that God would be taken simply as some sort of cosmic Santa Claus. That God would be just thinking of, and even people would use the phrase, the old man upstairs. How dare you? Do you have any idea who you're talking about? You know, you talk about uh, the old man living upstairs if you're living in an apartment, you're not saying that with reverence. You know, you're, you're saying that uh, almost with a sense that there may be a, a diminishing. There is never a diminishing in God. Eternal through the ages, He is almighty and exalted. He is holy and pure. He is righteous altogether. And He will judge the world in holiness and righteousness. Who would not tremble before that? Those who do not hear it. And I fear there are few who hear it these days. God is presented as glorious because of the good things he gives you. Not known as glorious because of the glory of his attributes and perfections. 
God is glorious even if he gave you nothing. God is glorious when he gives and when he takes away. As Job would say, the Lord gives and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God is undiminished in all of these things. And, and the, the scriptures, it continues to go on there when it says, um, worship the Lord, uh, ascribe to him the glory. Now it says do his name in our translations. The word do is not there. So literally it says ascribe to him the glory of his name. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, that is due, but part of that is because God was pleased to make known his person, his character, his glory through an array of a multitude of names. I mean, our, our preeminent one that we often remember is Yahweh or Jehovah, you know, the self-existent God through whom everything that exists came into existence and continues to exist right and, and that is that itself is powerful apart from him there would be nothing you know uh, that, that's why you know you go back and you think of some of the attempts of men and the exercise of their minds to display some manner of wisdom and they might say something to this effect i think therefore i am I'm sorry, God is, therefore you are. If it was not for him, you would not be, you would not think, you would not see, you would not hear, you would not breathe, you would not. And I just stop with not, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it, and, and to, to get that sense, but then the scriptures unpack a whole lot more. We have so many terms, and I'll sim for sake of brevity, you know, some of us are familiar with El Shaddai, God Almighty, or God All Sufficient. Uh, uh, many of us are familiar with uh, the constructs that take Yahweh or Jehovah and pair them with other words, Yahweh Tzidkenu, God Our Righteousness. Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. Even the name of Jesus, you will call his name Jesus or Yeshua, which means what? God is our salvation. And you start to think, give him the glory, do his name. Everything is because he is. He is all sufficient. He is almighty. He is the God who sees. He is the God who hears. He is the God who provides. He is the God of righteousness. He is the God who judges. He is the God who forgives. He is the God of salvation. So when you say give to him the glory of his name, I don't know if we have enough time right now. <laughs> to give him the glory that's due to his name. But when you see the piling up of the significance and the breadth of his name as revealed in the Old and the New Testaments, Lord and Master and Sovereign over all, you begin to say the glory due his name is to kind of give him all glory and none to any else because the glory of the moon emanates not from itself, does it? It is but the reflection of the sun. All the lesser glories that men glory and boast in, they only exist because the all-glorious one enables, endows, bestows. Do we understand that? Uh, when, if we slow down and think of that, you begin to think, so then, what does this mean? And then it goes on in the psalm to say, you know, when you're ascribing glory to him, the Lord reigns. He's not simply a God who wound up the universe and set back to watch it go. But he is one who is not only transcendent, who is powerfully present and eminent and active. He is absolutely in all circumstances working everything according to the counsel of his will. As it says in Psalm 115, 
our God is in heaven. He does everything that he pleases. But you know what? Before it said that, in verse five or six, you know what it says in verse one? Not to us, O Lord, not to us be the glory. You know, there comes to be this full recognition and we tend sometimes to pat ourselves on the chest and, and want others to pat us on the back, you know, and uh, give, us, give us affirmation and give us praise. And I know that sometimes in our feebleness we feel a sense of need for that. You know, and in recognition of the work and the grace of God through his instruments, we are to honor one another. We are to treat one another well. We are to speak well and, and respect one another. But all glory to God absolutely, eternally, exclusively to him and to him alone. He absolutely reigns over all. And again, the culmination of his glory, verse 13, says this. Before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth and he will judge the world in righteousness. Part of the glory of God and understanding it rightly includes the righteousness of God and the righteous judgments of God. Remember, we've been working our way, and it's been a while now, but in Romans chapter one, we were reminded of the gospel. Therein, the righteousness of God is revealed. And we remember that men who suppress the truth of God in their unrighteousness will stand before the wrath and the judgment of God. And so the scriptures begin to make all of these things wonderfully clear. And one of the things you do see at the top of your notes there, before I begin to break through a few smaller elements, let's, let's look at it in, a, in its full breadth, and then we'll see just a few of the elements described in scripture, and then again explode it at the end. Romans eleven thirty six 36 says this, after speaking that he owes us nothing. He is beyond our understanding. His judgments are beyond tracing out. Says these simple words, and I w would love for all of our brothers and sisters in Christ to grasp this a little clearer. Romans eleven thirty six. For from him. Now, because of the way that the grammar is placed out in this word, let me put these pieces together so that we don't miss it. For from him are all things. And through him are all things. And to and for him are all things. Wait a second. It sounds like you're saying everything that exists exists because of him. Everything that continues to exist and happen does so through him. And that ultimately the design and purpose of everything is for him. Yes, indeed. And how does that work out? The rest of that verse says, from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Tell you what, if we're going to ascribe to the Lord glory, we've got to start understanding who he is. We've got to start seeing the world around us through a different lens. You know, uh, the glories that, that men think they have are so insignificant. I mean, think about it. How many athletes glory in some particular accomplishment? which will likely be eclipsed by an athlete a few years down the road, right? They set a new world record. Everybody is looking at them. And then someone's going to beat that, aren't they? Someone's going to surpass that number. Someone's going to beat that time. And even if somebody doesn't, I'm going to guarantee you this. If they live long enough, they will not be able to match that time. <laughs> Right? They will not be able to uh, repeat that seeming moment of glory because there is diminishment. There is decline. But with God, his glory is forever, unabated, unhindered, undiminished. 
and it is a glorious thing to consider. So let's just begin to see some aspects looking through something of the scriptures that we would understand this. Reminding you of how great our God is demonstrated to us even in creation. Psalm 19 verse one, you're probably aware of it, acquainted with it. Psalm 19 verse one says this, the heavens declare the glory of God. And, it, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And so here is the reality. We look, and as far as men can presently tell, they cannot find the end of it. As we still build up our, our increased telescopes and continue to change our mathematical calculations, men still find themselves struggling in error. And for those who are reading, and they've been reading recently when the James Webb went up, again, cosmologists and scientists are saying, all right, we've got to rethink all of our models and expectations of the size, the scope, and the origins of the universe because a lot of what we now see doesn't fit our existing models. Do you know why it doesn't fit their existing models? because they try to conceive of a world that does not find its origin in God. The heavens declare His glory. And you can see it, and it has a blessed and beautiful order to it. Those who would navigate the seas could do so with a degree of confidence and consistency. Why? Because of the order of the hand of God. The stars, the sun, we are able to figure out even with very little understanding, some degree, which way is north? Which way is south? Now some of you are saying, okay, that's not easy. All right, which way is east? The sun rise. Which way is west? The sun setting. From that, you can normally figure out north and south if you kind of put those pieces together, right? And then further than that, oftentimes we can even learn to get some sense of the time of day if we understand the season and the location and all of, so, so much can be figured out because of the consistency and order of creation. And you know what it declares to us? What a God of order. You know, it, it's one thing and, and there exist in this world watchmakers. You know, and they put little pieces together, and I'm astounded by the way that they can work in, in such small ways. And everything that gets put together so that it spins, this spins at a certain pace, and this at another pace, and everything works perfectly so that it will keep time. Can you imagine that God has in the handiwork that is displayed the scope of the universe? I mean, again, what we're even seeing at night is very much limited. And then when we understand the galaxies beyond galaxies beyond galaxies and all of the wonder of God's hands, you think about that. And then, and then in all of that, you know, in the simple view of the totality of creation, how big is the earth? It's kind of what, like a speck of dirt in the galaxy. And then what about me? As God created man out of the dust of the earth? So, you know, I am just a, a, a there's not even a proper word, a, a, a piddle, uh, it's not a real word, uh, of dust on a fleck of dust in the totality of the universe and that, and that God was pleased to set his love on me in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world? How can it be? Oh God, what is man that you are mindful of him? We ought to be absolutely astounded and amazed and that God, the infinite, eternal God, would then send his own son in the form of sinful man. And the eternal, almighty, unbounded Son of God would take on flesh, would know hunger, would know weariness, would know suffering, 
would bear our sin and would know death. And then, praise God, would know victory over the grave, would know victory over death, and would in himself grant such to all who are his. Victory over death and the grave. Oh, creation. John Calvin said, uh, all creation exists to display the glory of God. And uh, I'm not impressed by that statement. Everybody ought to figure that out. You know, it shouldn't be left to supposedly the eminent theologians to say what is a simple statement. Everything displays the glory of God. Again, I want to remind you of the richness of these things beyond uh, creation. When we think of salvation, what a remarkable and astounding gift of God because we're reminded of this in Ephesians 2, 8 and following. For by grace... You have been saved. And then that beautiful phrase, and that not of yourselves, that not your own doing. You didn't do it. You didn't accomplish your own salvation. You didn't get it done. Who did? God did. And and again, uh, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. And that word boast in other places is translated glory. We would not glory in ourselves. We would not say, I did what they didn't do. No. We have one boast. He did what I could not do. He worked in me what I would not do. All of my hope and all of my salvation is by grace. What a great God. My boast and glory is in him. That's why the scriptures say those beautiful words. I loved when it said uh, the introduction of Jesus to Mary in Matthew 1, 21. We speak of this often. What did he say? She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, Yesus, which is God our salvation. Why? For he will save his people from their sins so listen if you have been saved from your sins who saved you from your sins yes we are by the grace of god his people let me just read you a few verses that exalt in this reality first chronicles 1635 says this say also save us O God of our salvation, gather us and deliver us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Save us so that what? We're better than everyone else and we can call ourselves the elite. No. Save us so that we can uh, uh, enjoy life better. No. What is the ultimate ends of our salvation? that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Now, I'm thankful that there are a host of other benefits attended to that salvation he gives us, right? There is hope, there is peace, there is joy, there is the forgiveness of sin, there is reconciliation, there is rich relationship with God, there is so much that's attended to it, but its ultimate design is the glory of God got to see that psalm 79 verse 9 says this help us O god of our salvation for the glory of your name deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake and i think sometimes when we read that it sounds weird to us today if we were to word it in the modern church you know how we would word this verse Save us for our glory among the nations so that they look at us and are impressed. Uh, uh, Deliver us and atone for us for our sake. This says, for the glory of your name, for your name's sake. So ultimately, our salvation is for his own sake, his own praise, his own name, his own glory. We are beneficiaries of eternal intra-Trinitarian love. Because God loved himself. 
the scripture tells us in Ephesians 1, he gave us, predestined us, gave us, as it says in John also, to his son before the foundation of the world. And Christ did what? He came that he might reconcile us to the Father. And in so doing, that he would be to the glory of God. And the Spirit would come and apply all of those things. And Jesus says of the Spirit, I will send the Spirit and he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And we realize, wait a second. All of creation and all of salvation is an expression of God's love for himself. That he might receive glory and eminence above and before all things. Revelation 19.1 reminds us of the song of the great multitude in heaven. They are crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. And in the reminder of those things, when you say it those ways, it's a reminder of this. Salvation did not belong to man. Salvation did not belong to the church. Salvation belongs to our God. He bestows it on whom he pleases. He accomplishes it by his power. power uh, glory belongs to God. Apart from him, there is no other expression of what seems glorious in our sight and power belongs to him i mean it's it's the fullness of all of these things his above all now what about the scripture say about the son of man well in john 1 14 it says this the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory the glory as of the only son of the father full of grace and truth. Now again, we don't understand those things. They had the privilege of seeing, and, and, and uh, consider this, one who was tempted in every way like we are, but without sin. He never sinned externally, and he never sinned internally we get reasonably well at minimizing that which is visible but you and I know well the sins of the heart and the sins of the mind Jesus was like us in every respect tempted in all ways as we are yet without sin that's a glimpse of the glory of God in his holiness. And when we begin to see uh, some of these things unpacked, the word of God just continues to, to um, display these things so powerfully and beautifully. Uh, the scripture says this in John 12. Jesus says in John 12, verse 18, as he's come to this hour, his soul is troubled in contemplation of his soon suffering. He says this in verse 28 of John 12. Father, glorify your name. The joy set before him was not in the experience of suffering, but in the way that he would bring glory to his father in the redemption of all those given to him in his suffering. Father, glorify your name. Listen, then a voice came from heaven that said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. What a shocking and unexpected declaration of the design and priority of God, the Father and the Son. It says this in John 13, for those who didn't quite get it in John 12. 13 verse 31, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man, that is he himself, is glorified and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. And our minds go round and round and say, you know, you can't use a sentence with the word glorify so many times. Well, 
uh, if that doesn't show you the emphasis, I don't know what will in the design of God. And then Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John 17 says these words in verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has now come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. I mean, this is the son's desire and the son's intention. Desire for himself from the father, desire from him to the father, glory. Wow. Verse four and five, Jesus says, I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So Jesus in all of his acts of obedience and and all of his preparation and design and finished work of his incarnation, the ultimate design of it is what? Having glorified the Father on earth. And then I, again, I, it was John 16, 14 that I reminded you, Jesus said, the spirit will glorify me. I mean, so much is caught up in this that it, time does not permit us to consider all of these things, but if you consider for a moment when God manifests his glory and he would do so in limited visual ways to the children of Israel and they would look and they would see a a display of his glory, a cloud that is on fire. He would descend in a cloud up uh, onto Mount Horeb and the scriptures will say things like this in, in Exodus 19. Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke. Again, they can't see it undebated. No one can see God unless they die. So it always has to be mitigated and mediated, otherwise you are in trouble. It says this, wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended it and on fire and the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain greatly trembled. So that these people would think, ah, we are in trouble says in verse 16, the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, covered it six days. On the seventh day, he called Moses out of the midst of it. The appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people. And so you know what they did? They trembled. And when God spoke, you know what they did? They were undone and they said, stop. Moses, you go up and listen to him because if we continue to see what we see and hear what we hear, we will die. You go find out what he says and you tell it to us. His glory is too much for us. It's crushing us. And then there's a time later where Moses himself will say to God, show me your glory. And again, he's not even grasping the fullness of that request because what does God say? Yeah, you get in the cleft of a rock. (laughs) You know, I will cover you with my hand and cause my goodness to pass before you. And in that, he would declare something of his rich sovereignty and salvation. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will pardon whom I will pardon. Speaks also of his judgment, bringing judgment on children and children's children, and all of that in the display of his holiness. And he would cover, he would declare something of his holiness, his gloriousness, his sovereignty, his selection, and his attributes. He would pass by, and then Moses would get a little peekaboo right? Just a little glimpse from the backside of that diminished manifestation of the glory of God. That's astounding. And we, we think of these things, oh, it is so much. God's dis- God is glorified in so many aspects of these things. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, unpack a few last thoughts as we work our way towards the end of our consideration together this morning. Uh, some of the things that we want, I want us to understand is, again, I encourage you to read Ephesians 1 this afternoon just for your own contemplation and uh, 
the inflaming of our hearts because remember, our redemption, forgiveness, and sure inheritance in Christ is designed that we might glorify him. In speaking of these things, it says in verse 12 of Ephesians 1, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Why do we exist? For the praise of his glory. Why are we, according to Isaiah, called by his name? To the praise of his glory. Everything is designed for that. Even further, our faith and our sealing with the Holy Spirit in, in verse 13 and 14. Verse 14 ends by saying this, to the praise of his glory. Then further unpacks our deepening understanding of our hope and of the calling that we have in Christ. How does all this unfold? Well, the Father of glory, verse 17, who has called us, verse 18, to show us what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Why? Verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might, might which he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him in the heavenly places. Everything is designed for the glory of God. Well, what about the gifts that God gives us? 1 Peter 4, 11. Whatever talents, skills, whatever magnificent displays we might muster among men, whoever speaks as one who speaks the very words of God, 1 Peter 4, 11. Whoever serves with the strength God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Wait, well, is it, isn't it through these things that we are edified? Yes, but our, the design of our edification and enrichment ultimately is for the glory of God. You're making it seem like the design of everything from beginning to end is ultimately by God, from God, for God. It's all about God. Yeah. And we are, because of his great purposes, blessed beneficiaries. Ephesians 3.21 says these simple words, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Just those simple ideas. So when we come together as a church, when we contemplate the grace that's ours, we come together that he might be glorified among us. If people's design in coming together was to glorify God, you think that would change what they do? How they do it? What they say? Because the tendency would not be to make much of men. It would be to make much of God and make much of what God has done by his mercy among the kingdom of men. Such a great, so I mean so much so that if we were to have time, uh, we would be reminded even the strength that he provides that enables us to serve and obey and work and do good deeds. Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. So it's not so that we get the praise? No. Indeed, if anyone does praise us, if we are rightly informed, we want to deflect that praise and defer to the true divine, the one who has given and granted all these things. Uh, even further, what about, so you're saying w with regard to my whole life, it's all about God? The, my highest priority that should be that in everything I should bring him glory? Yes, 1 Corinthians 6.20 says this, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. So as long as you've got a body what should you be doing using it to glorify god well in everything in, in in the mighty in the majestic in the miraculous as well as in the mundane yes indeed the scripture will go so wonderfully far as to say first corinthians 10 31 so whether you eat or drink or Whatever you do. Oh, wait a second. That sounded pretty comprehensive. 
Yeah, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, what? Do all to the glory of God. So let me simply summarize. All that God is, all that is, all that I have, all that I do, all that I now am in Christ, all that I will one day be in Christ, all mercy, all judgment, all salvation, all condemnation, all history, all creation, all that has been, is, or ever shall be is for the glory of God alone. And so you back up and you say not merely what is the chief end of man. You say what is revealed as the chief end of God to display, make known, and bring to himself glory alone let's pray lord we are amazed at your word and also sometimes shocked how easily we overlook how regularly and replete your glory is mentioned lord i pray that you would grant us to read and pray and think with open eyes and hearts that we would begin to understand all that I am, all that I have, it's not about me. It's not merely for my temporal pleasure and my earthly enjoyment. We do thank you that you have given us things and that there is some degree of passing pleasure in them. But Lord, we pray that we would learn to give you thanks and glory in all things. We would learn to enjoy what we have. We would be able to enjoy in the lack when it is given, when it is taken away that we would be able to look upon all those things that are not only given to us physically, but the realities emotionally, spiritually, eternally, and that everything is designed for doxology, that you would receive the eternal praise of your people. And Lord, we know that even now those who blaspheme, there will come a day in the full display of your glory in judgment that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Glory will be ascribed to you that is due your name from all the earth and all the nations and all creation because all glory is due your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.